my previous section, I mentioned an important fact that sometimes philologists working on humanist texts tend to overlook. What I'm referring to is that humanists were not native Latin speakers. Their native languages were Italian, French, Spanish, German, and so on. True enough, they went to grammar school more or less at the same age when our kids start elementary school, and grammar in those days meant Latin. Yet, it was basic Latin, declensions, tenses, and so on, just to provide kids with a smattering of that language for practical, not literary purposes. That Latin was far, remarkably far, from pure classical standards. Authoring polished prose or poetry with a satisfactory degree of rhetorical ornamentation required much more than that. It was, to put it bluntly, a horse of a different color, including rhetorical colors. In sum, humanists were more or less in the same position as an international student in the U.S. trying to learn how to speak and write good English. You may have faced the same problem with other languages, especially if you have been students in some foreign university for a while and had to turn in papers written in that language, say French or Spanish. A sort of rule of thumb is as follows. Learn a series of expressions and formulas from good writers in that language and use them when necessary. That way you have a stock of correct and elegant phrases that you may pull out from time to time. It's like putting together a series of index cards to refer to when describing or discussing a certain topic. I've used this simile, the index cards, scede in Latin, because that is exactly what humanists did. In their case, this process would often take on the form of a dictionary that they compiled and updated over time, usually over their whole lifetime, by adding synonyms, expressions, formulas, and terms of phrase from classical authors and sometimes fellow humanists too. This explains, in some cases, a sense of repetitiousness in their writings whenever they happen to discuss the same topic, or, to use the technical word for it, a topos. So, don't be surprised if your collation of manuscripts suggests that a humanist made mistakes in, say, an oration or a poem, incorrect tenses or moods with verbs, and wrong endings with nouns or adjectives, faulty meters and lyrics, odd syntax, and so on, must sometimes be attributed to the authors, especially in the early stages of their careers, not to the scribes. Finally, what I've just said accounts for the somewhat hybrid Latin of humanists from the late 14th and early 15th century, when their prose, with its imitation and readaptation of classical Roman prose, was still in the making, or in its infancy, if you will, after Petrarch's pioneering attempts. A case in point is Coluccio Salutati, whom we mentioned in the previous section when speaking of Bruni's dialogues, as the mentor of a whole generation of humanists in late 14th century Florence. Modern scholars tend to depict Salutati as a twofold, somewhat inconsistent figure, a man at a crossroads, to echo the title of a famous book on him by Ronald Witt, an author on the threshold of a new era that he himself has significantly contributed to usher in, while retaining some no less significant features of the age about to disappear. A comparison of his Latin prose with that of his own pupils, Bracciolini and Bruni, for instance, is revealing of the progress made by this younger generation in their attempt to recapture ancient, that is, at that stage, mostly Ciceronian Latin. Salutati's last work can prove particularly helpful in this respect. In 1403, he replied to the invective against the Florentines, penned two years earlier by one of his own former pupils, Antonio Loschi. After moving to Florence from native Vicenza at a young age to imbibe humanist learning from Salutati and his circle, Loschi eventually became secretary to the Duke of Milan, Gian Galeazzo Visconti, that is Florence's arch enemy. Since Salutati meant to confute his opponent's accusations point by point, he quoted Loschi's invective in full within his reply. A precious manuscript now at Oxford, written under Salutati's own supervision, that is, an ideograph to adopt philological lexicon, reports in red, to differentiate them from the author's words in black, the excerpts from Salutati's text that the Florentine Chancellor patiently debunks. I shall return to this manuscript later in this video because of its importance in regard to two other issues I'd like to discuss, though briefly punctuation and marginal notes, especially when useful to fix corrupt passages. For the time being, 
I limit myself to emphasizing that these two texts that we find side by side in Talutati's last work, whose bombastic title in English reads, Reply to a slanderous detractor who has written many wounding things against the renowned city of Florence, show clearly how much more classicizing the younger humanist Latin prose was becoming in those years at the turn of the century vis-à-vis -vis the previous generation. Salutati, for instance, often follows a medieval spelling that would soon horrify younger colleagues, not to mention such demanding linguists like Valla. His lexicon, too, proves obsolete when compared with that of his own pupils, even for such ordinary words as chikur, domestic pig, that he writes in the medieval way, chikuris, although the classical spelling can be found in ancient works, including Cicero's, that Salutati knew. In other words, Wilbur, the protagonist of Charlotte's Web, would be a chikur, not chikuris, in classical Latin. In terms of classical standards, things are even worse with Salutati's syntax, which often reveals its vernacular backdrop. A telling and frequent case is his use of the conjunction quod to introduce a subordinate clause. Finally, in this text, as in almost all of his myriad missives, that is, official letters, for the Florentine Republic, Salutati adopts the rhythm known as cursus velox in medieval prose, a feature that younger humanists were already then starting to abandon as alien to ancient practice. By contrast, Loski's prose stands out as much more classicizing and close to the Ciceronian model. Loski was best known at the time for his innovative commentary on Cicero's speeches. And yet his prose is not completely free from errors and ambiguities either, as Salutati himself remarks in his reply. A more interesting case is when humanists use an older colleague's text as a starting point to shape and develop their own style. We can notice this phenomenon in a manuscript of Bruni works that was owned by the Florentine humanist Giannozzo Manetti. The text of Bruni's dialogues in this manuscript, which belongs to family G in that work's Stema Codicum, that is far from the archetype, was dictated by Manetti to the scribe, as revealed by the characteristics of some of these peculiar readings. I would like now to show you the tables comparing Manetti's Lecciones Singulares, that is, unique variants, with the text as transmitted by the other manuscripts, MN and Reliqui, respectively. This will prove that Manetti decided to insert some changes just as he was reading Bruni's dialogues aloud to the scribe. Manetti liked such variants better than Bruni's choice because of his own personal style and literary taste, as we can notice from the original works that Manetti started authoring right afterwards, that is, from 1440 onwards. Luckily for us, a colophon in this exemplar attests that it was written in 1439 which means, again, right before Manetti started producing a series of texts whose prose is highly indebted to Brunis.